I think we'll get started again. Our second panel includes our friends from EY, um, who, and they're going to walk us through a, case, a very interesting case study about a cross-border investigation and the practical challenges that are involved in conducting such an investigation. Uh, first, we have Mikhail Belov, uh, goes by Mike. Um, Mike leads the EY Minneapolis Forensic and Integrity Services Practice with over 18 years of combined forensic accounting and compliance experience. Mike specializes in working with clients on complex compliance and financial matters, including global accounting and financial fraud, bribery, and corruption matters. He assists clients in the design, implementation, and monitoring of corporate compliance and ethics programs. He also leads global investigations and performs due diligence and assists clients in litigation matters, the assessment of internal controls, and the prevention and detection of fraud. Mike speaks Russian fluently and has conducted and managed engagements in the, in the U.S., Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. He is a certified fraud examiner and a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners and Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics. Thank you, Mike. Um, on the phone today, and uh, he wanted to be here in person, we have Rishi Balakan. Rishi is, uh, was supposed to be here from Chicago. Turns out there was a big storm in Chicago yesterday. All of his flights were canceled. I hear that there was an airplane that ran off the runway in O'Hare. You can pull up the video if you want to see it. So um, he couldn't be here, but he is here by phone. Um, Rishi is a principal in EY's Forensic Technology and Discovery Services Practice with over 15 years of experience working in e-discovery and information governance in investigations, regulatory response matters, divestitures, and due diligence reviews. Prior to joining EY, Rishi served as corporate counsel for one of the world's largest pharmaceutical companies, and more recently, he served as e-discovery coordinator for one of Chicago's top labor and employment firms. Since joining EY in 2011, Rishi has worked extensively on a number of large-scale electronic discovery matters, including cross-border data processing that has involved preparing data collected from 26 countries and setting up mobile sites in countries where local data privacy laws prevent the movement of data outside the country's borders. Welcome, Mike and Rishi, and uh, with that, Perfect. let Mike begin. Perfect. Thank you. So thank you so much for having us here today. Um, you know, there, there's kind of two topics we're going to cover uh, during our discussion. Yes, perfect. Um, I'll start off with the kind of the common unique uh, compliance challenges we see uh, in, in, in foreign jurisdictions, really basically what keeps our clients up at night. Um, uh, and then uh, Rishi would also talk about the cross-border discovery consideration while I should speak to uh, uh, present a case study. Um, you know, when we were first asked to kind of present or, you know, speak at this panel, you know, obviously kind of top of mind topics that come to me is the BRIC countries, right? The Brazil, Russia, India, and China. We see a lot of our clients spend a lot of time, significant time there. So some of the content that we're going to present today touches on those, uh, on those countries as well as some other regions as well. And really just kind of list out some of the challenges that we, we, we're currently seeing on the ground. And really, you know, it's, it's, it's a good kind of... The first panel is very interesting and, and really kind of to follow up on Bob's comments about China. As you can see, these are just examples. Um, there's definitely a lot of compliance challenges operating in China. Um, you know, I, I feel like the market in, in, is becoming a lot more sophisticated. The fraudsters are becoming a lot more sophisticated just in light of the constant investigation, whether it's by U.S. or, you know, local or other uh, regulators as well as just, you know, internal uh, investigations as well. Um, when I speak about China, I like to always start with the first proverb, you know, basically the Chinese proverb saying, the mountain is high, the emperor is far away. Basically, all that means is the corporate reach is very limited. And I think it's limited because culturally in China, people will speak to and, and really listen to their local management. You know, the, the message, the tone at the top coming from the U.S. doesn't really resonate more, more often than not, um, especially, uh, you know, in, 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 in companies that are very decentralized where there's not a lot of oversight. Um, <clears throat> So definitely that's a pretty prevalent um, uh, finding that we have as part of our investigations. Um, and once again, you know, is the second bullet there kind of touches on the manage, managing director or local management really having to ultimate control. That's true. You know, basically no one will quite question the local management. Um, basically, you know, it's either for fear of retaliation at times. Sometimes it's just basically that's just cultural norm. You really listen to what the tone, the tone of the middle or the top within the local country says. Um, also, the lack of willingness to raise some of the compliance issues is really 
you know, we, we definitely see that quite often, you know, the use of the hotline. Um, it, it's, it's, it's not that common in China to use that, you know, more often than not, it's more kind of Western countries where you see uh, more uh, common use of the hotline in China, you're not going to see that. And once again, it's either fear of retaliation or just respect for the authority. The other bucket, and you'll see kind of the, 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 the four bullets in between, is really all surrounding the third party, uh, the, the use of third party intermediaries. And that's very common. And I feel like, you know, once again, the, the, the market is becoming a very sophisticated. And it's also commercially, it makes sense sometimes to use third party intermediaries, but also the fraudsters are trying to figure out ways how to use the third party intermediaries to commit, commit fraud, bribery, corruption. Um, you know, once again, geography requires the use of third parties. It goes without saying, you know, if you think about China, it's pretty much the same as the geographical size as U.S. And, but then, uh, unlike the U.S., the tier one cities in China are all pretty much on the eastern seaboard. And then if you consider, you know, the, the central and the western part of China, you definitely require use of third parties. Also, it's very common for state-owned entities to, uh, to utilize local third parties or vendors to basically to work with them. So international manufacturers that are coming into China are then obliged to work through other third party intermediaries that are dict dictated by, by, by local uh, Chinese authorities. Um, sometimes it's either working through you know, another vendor or subcontractor or sometimes also creating a joint venture. Obviously with you know, u utilizing third parties also increases the, the, the risk of security, data security in particular, because obviously then they have kind of insight to your, to your uh, data and, and, and systems. Um, conflict of interest are definitely very pervasive, and that goes with the um, distributor, so on the sales side standpoint, as well as on the supply and render side sense, uh, standpoint. Um, there are ways to, you know, China has uh, public databases where you can look into and see the ultimate beneficiaries or the owners of the uh, local Chinese companies. But once again, you know, um, a lot of that is, you know, based on information that's provided to the to, to authorities. Sometimes, uh, you know, those are might not be beneficial or, uh, owners, so you really don't have transparency there. But a lot of our clients definitely are finding issues where they're comparing kind of their uh, employee master file to customer master file, the vendor master file. There's definitely, you know, quite a bit of matches there. Um, another point, you know, point I'll touch on is gift giving is an important part of life. I think we all know that. Um, and I think in the past you might have heard about use of red um, envelopes. So basically it was envelopes, you know, stuck with cash. Um, you know, nowadays that's kind of gone away. That's not really the cultural norm really anymore. Gift cards are, and it's cash gift cards, right? So basically that just replaced the, the red envelopes. You know, those are much more difficult to find because nowadays you will get receipts from supermarkets and you can fabricate saying, listen, we purchased, you know, necessary supplies or whatnot. But really, it was the gift cards that were purchased, and it's you know it's a cash equivalent. Uh, so we definitely see a pervasive use of that. Um, also, the use of fake or substitute FAPIAOs. So FAPIAOs are official government um, um, invoices, pretty much this is uh, you know issued by a tax bureau, that are then provided by the seller to the purchaser. And really, you know the whole objective there is that you have to pay VAT on on any purchase that you're making. Um, you know, we're obviously historically we've seen a lot of fake uh, FAPIOs where basically it was fake documentation provided by the seller to the purchaser. Um, now we're seeing more substitute FAPIOs being used. Those are actually legitimate FAPIOs that are registered with the government. However, they're really used to disguise some um, inappropriate activity. Um, you know, there's also a, a website, it's similar to eBay, where you can actually purchase some of these FAPIOs. Uh, from the government, uh, and basically you pay a 6% VAT on the total amount, let's say you're purchasing say $100, you pay 6% 6 VAT on that. In addition to that, they will also give you a meal, a meal kind of breakdown and then also a, a corporate credit card um, um, point of sale sheet, which you can fabricate to your desire. So once again, there's a mechanism to use these FAPIAOs to disguise inappropriate activity. Back in the day, you can also land in the Shanghai airport and you can just buy a stack of FAPIAOs right at the airport. Mike, did you say that that FAPIO website was a government-run website? So no, it's, it's, it's basically like an eBay. But yeah, okay. Their FAPIAOs are actually government registered, so they're actually okay. legitimate government register receipts. Okay. So the way to verify FAPIO is typically you go on a government web website, you type in the number that's appearing on the FAPIO, and you can see whether it's a legitimate FAPIO. So all of these would be legitimate. However, because you already paid VAT to the government, but they could be used to disguise some inappropriate activity. Let's say you made a bribe or you know any other payments. 
um, extensive use technology, and I think that goes along with everything that we're talking today. And I put it kind of at the end, but really, I think that's just you know very pervasive in, in China. Once again, the sophistication where we really start seeing um, use of email for communication. Uh, a lot of this you know, mobile device use uh, chat messages. So obviously, to a to get to that data is becoming very, very more difficult. And the processors are obviously maintaining multiple phones. Sometimes you see people come to interviews with three different cell phones. Uh, and then you're like, well, can we get your corporate phone? Sure, here, take this one. And it's obviously blank, there's nothing on it. Um, so obviously that's just a, a concern for any comp company to do business, but also for investigators as well. Um, another um, country where we see a lot of our clients spend quite a bit of time is India. Um, it's not as sophisticated, I would say, you know, based on my experience from a um, compliance challenge standpoint as China, you know, even though there's obviously a lot of enforcement from U.S. regulators and local regulators and a lot of investigations have been done, still the schemes are just not as sophisticated, so they're a little easier to find. Um, so, for example, the conflict of interest, once again, you know, if you compare some of the master files, you'll be able to find some of the matches. Uh, the documentation rarely exists. If it does exist, it's you know, sometimes you can start kind of poking holes in it because there's a lot of duplication of the invoices or the sequencing of the numbers is very similar. So you're kind of finding some of the schemes and it's a little easier to find than in China just because, you know, once again, I think it's just, you know, there was less enforcement in India uh, historically. Um, one of the points I will make is that, you know, there's definitely pervasive use of maintaining two sets of books and it's mainly by your third party suppliers. So any company that exercises audit rights or the distributors or any other um, you know, third party uh, agents, you know, typically go in and ask, where's your cash book? You know, the cash book is basically, it's the black cash register where it basically has all the ins and outs. And then they'll give you other books, which are statutory books, which are very, very different. So once again, it's just knowing, you know, having the right resources to ask the right questions. Um, but once again, that's really common and pervasive practice from what we see in India. Cash is king. A lot of transactions are conducted in cash. So the cash register is where you can find the gold, uh, if you will. And once again, extensive use of technology. Once again, it's very similar to China, where um, you know, use of mobile devices, applications, uh, rarely anything being put in email form. Um, Russia, I think, is probably one of the most sophisticated countries in terms of kind of the schemes uh, from what we've seen, because obviously, I think Russia has been investigated under the microscope for a very long time now. Um, you know, and once again, kind of the, the buckets are very similar to the other themes you've seen, kind of use of third parties you know, the books and records, internal controls. Um, in terms of use of third parties, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the prevalence of one-day companies, but these are actually not, they're called one-day, but realistically they're actually open for less than a year. The reason they, you know, companies are being set up to do that is so that they actually don't pay tax at the end of the year. So once again, it's from a tax evasion standpoint, but it also allows uh, the fraudsters to get, you know, basically create these black cash register. So you create this, you know, uh, one day company, you, you know, basically fund them uh, and then they basically close down shop and you don't have any services rendered by them and the, the cash is gone. Um, once again, geography requires use of third parties. Um, Russia is huge and we definitely commonly see that. Um, and obviously similar to China, you know, sometimes the, uh, uh, the government authorities kind of require to work with some of the known providers uh, or some joint ventures as well. Um, we also see on um, the, the lack of um, visibility, you know, in, into the margins are really, you know, the, 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 you know, that your third party, let's say, distributors are making. Um, and, and it's really driven by the fact that, you know, the, pro, you know, the, the schemes are becoming so complex and there's going to be a lot of subnetworks. So some of our clients who exercise audit rights on the distributors typically go to tier one distributor. However, other tier one distributors could be multiple sub-tiers as well. So that's also very common practice in there. So you may not have visibility to the overall chain of events, the margin, and where the money is actually going. So once again, just keep in mind that that's really pervasive and, you know, the use of third parties and kind of the beneficial ownership is really, you know, tough to identify in Russia. Um, once again, uh, uh, common use of two sets of books. Um, and once again, it's also driven by kind of the local versus international tax rules. But once again, that gives a, an opportunity to companies or your third party uh, counterparts to, you know, obviously create some fictitious um, uh, or use money for, you know, for illicit purposes. Um, in terms of supporting documents, um, this is the one country where you're actually going to find every single page that you want. You know, basically, you're going to have a contract purchase order, invoice, 
proof or active acceptance of the services were rendered in a payment order. And the reason you're going to find that is because it's required by the statutory, it's statutory requirements. Because anytime there's a statutory audit, you're supposed to have that packet of documents available. However, it's form or substance. More often than not, we find that the contracts are fabricated, even though they say consulting services, and they'll give you a paragraph of what the services were for, nothing was actually provided. Um, Obviously, asking for that proof of performance, what else was provided, and say there's consulting, is there documentation for that consulting? You know, is there a report? What else did they provide? Is there communication that you can showcase that there's actually something was rendered? That's where you actually start to, you know, find issues. The documentation is just not supported. Um, and then the widespread use of the 1S or 1C accounting system, it's basically a Soviet-built accounting system. Uh, and the majority of the companies in Russia utilize that system. They're not going to be on SAP. And really, the visibility to the general ledger detail is very, very limited. Uh, you know, as we, we sometimes expect, you know, you know, thousands of accounts being available to give you transparency to transactions. You're not going to get that with Russian companies. Um, and then finally, I'll touch on kind of Latin America. Not to forget about Latin America and Middle East and Africa as well. You know, once again, I think Latin America. Obviously, we're continuing to see the the Operation Car Wash, or basically the Petrobras investigation, and a lot of ramifications coming from there. Um, I feel like, you know, when I travel to Brazil, obviously you hear a lot, you know, it's a top of mind for a lot of people about the bribery and corruption. And, um, you know, once again, you know, every, the public, general public understands the severity of this. Um, but then again, you know, in terms of we definitely commonly see a breakdown of controls and books and records. And similar Middle East and Africa, I think Middle East and Africa is probably the least sophisticated when it comes from schemes. And once again, it's just very manual records. Sometimes there are really no records existing. Um, and then really just that the perception of corruption is pretty high. So I'll stop there. Um, I know that was a lot. Uh, and I'll just pa pass it on to Rishi to talk about the, uh, the e-discovery considerations uh, case study. <coughs> Hi, thanks Mike, and hopefully everyone can hear me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and yes. first of all, just sorry that I couldn't be there in person. Uh, as you heard, <coughs> all kinds of tra travel challenges yesterday, including being rebooked five different times onto five different flights, but eventually gave up. But wanted to thank Fredrickson for making the arrangement to allow me to still be able to present to you all. And so this morning, we've heard a lot about <coughs> global data privacy regulations and global data protection regulations. And as Mike just outlined, there are a number of different compliance and corruption challenges that organizations face on a global basis. So that really leads us to the question of how do we conduct an investigation in one of these foreign countries while still balancing and making sure we're <coughs> compliant with the data privacy regulations and the <coughs> protection regulations in each of those countries. And so really the best way to illustrate the point is to use a real life example, a case study, because the short answer is there's no one size fits all approach to, to navigating data privacy concerns when performing an investigation. There are a number of different things that have to be considered, the nature of the matter, whether there's been a document request from a government regulator, where those government regulators are located, uh, the, the actual nature of the allegations, the countries in question, and so on. So this case study is actually a real life example, one of the projects that, that I worked on with a number of other EY colleagues. And in this matter, our client had been subpoenaed by the SEC and the DOJ, and the subpoena requested the production of documents from custodians who resided in over 15 different countries globally. And these countries included places, various places in the EU, various places in Asia, specifically China and, and Switzerland, in addition to, to the US. So as a collective team, EY, the client, and the client's outside counsel had to navigate a variety of different data <coughs> privacy rules and the China state secret rules that Bob had talked about when, when approaching this matter. So. Following the contracting process, and, and again, Stan had mentioned the importance of, of making sure contracts are all applicable and allow you to work on the matter in the capacity that you're being hired to work. After the contracting process, we, we began what is essentially the first stage of any e-discovery process as it relates to a litigation or an investigation, and that was the data preservation and collection process. So if we can move to the next slide, please, Mike. So as I had mentioned, we had data in a variety of different countries around the world, and we wanted to make sure that we were not inappropriately collecting and pre preserving information in each of those countries. So our first step was to have 
calls with local council in each of those different jurisdictions. Those calls also included members from the UI team, outside council who was navigating the matter more broadly, the client's data protection office, and, and the local council to determine the strategy within each country. Do we need to get consent? How can we get consent? If we're meeting with the custodians and we're interviewing them, what should we be telling them about that? Now, to Stan's point, that's not concrete, but it was a step that we wanted to go through just to make sure that we were trying to document as many of the processes as, as possible and to show, should anyone come knocking on our door, that we had met with the custodians and that we had, had obtained consent. Now, in this matter, we didn't have the challenge of needing to do covert investigations. All of the custodians who were subject to this, subject to the subpoena, were aware of the investigation, were notified in the investigation. In some instances, when you're conducting an investigation, you specifically don't want the custodians to know, and you will have to take a different approach. But regardless of, of your whether you can get consent or not, you should always consult with local counsel to make sure that you are not falling afoul of uh, data privacy regulation or some nuance in local law that requires some kind of approval to be obtained prior to collection and preservation. Uh, once this was completed, we met with each of the custodians. We had the custodians sign the consent forms. We explained to them that the data would likely be transferred to the US for ultimate production to the SEC and DOJ. And we facilitated the collection in each of those countries. So as a second step, we then needed to figure out where we could host all of the information. Now, typically, you'd want to move all the data to one location. This, from a technology perspective, is easily the most efficient way to approach any type of investigation. You can leverage more tools and technologies. You can leverage some of the advanced AI that can potentially help streamline and facilitate the review. Having the data split up in different locations makes that a little bit more complicated. Now, Ideally, we would have moved all the documents to the US, but as Sten and, and Bob had both explained, that's not very easy with data that resides in the EU or within China, and actually applies to Asia as well. So we had to decide and pick a few strategic locations in which we would host the data. And what we ended up doing was hosting in the US, Switzerland, China, and Hong Kong. And Hong Kong was specifically chosen as the central location for all of the the documents that were in Asia with the exception of China. And this is because Hong Kong has adequacy <laughs> rules that allow for other Asian countries to transfer the data to Hong Kong. So again, just very similar concept to GDPR. Hong Kong was a very safe place for us to aggregate all of the Asian data. The Chinese information couldn't move there because of the, the state secret regulations that Bob had talked about earlier. <coughs> So moving forward, I wanted to take a deeper dive on Switzerland and, and China in particular. So if we just <coughs> a couple of slides, actually this slide shows the different locations in which we hosted information. Just a couple of things to note, we did host data in the UK and in Russia and Singapore. That was only a strategic consideration. It wasn't for data privacy purposes. Had anything come up and had we needed to aggregate that information, we would have done it in one of those four primary workspaces that I had mentioned. So while we did have data there, it, it wasn't because of data protection or data privacy regulations. So taking a deeper dive on the two geographies that I just mentioned, China and Switzerland, we'll start with China first. And as Bob outlined earlier, China has a st China state secrets regulation, which prevents the movement of information from China to another country <coughs> without it being reviewed for, for state secrets. Unfortunately, our client didn't have some of those waivers in place that, that Bob had, had discussed. A lot of this documentation was, was fairly old, and they, they, I think, have started that process but didn't have it in place. So what that essentially meant was no data could leave China without it being reviewed first for state secrets. So we actually had to make a decision at this point, would we have all of the data collected in China reviewed for state secrets, or would we conduct a review in China for responsiveness and then have only the responsive documents reviewed for state secrets? And we did some cost-benefit analysis of the two different approaches and determined that a responsiveness review in China was the best way to approach it. We would filter down the number of documents that went for the more expensive state secrets review. And, and so that was the approach that was taken. <clears throat> now, moving on to Switzerland, we 
actually have some strict data privacy regulations in in Switzerland. Switzerland's part of the EU, but but not formally. So they have their own specific data privacy regulations, and those require the redaction of private information that also expands across to metadata and so on. So we needed to make sure that any document that left Switzerland was appropriately reviewed and redacted and steps were taken to minimize the data. Again, going back to one of the points that Sten made, we wanted to be able to show a paper trail that we took the appropriate steps to reduce the population and make sure we we're only producing to the SEC and DOJ the information that was relevant to the investigation and nothing more. Now, there was one interesting nuance with, with Switzerland, and that was that our client had also, be, had also been subpoenaed by FINMA, which is uh, the Swiss financial regulator. And we also had to produce documents to FINMA. And that actually presented a unique opportunity to our outside counsel because our outside counsel was able to, to share that information with the SEC and DOJ. And the SEC and DOJ were already working with FINMA. And they actually ended up entering into an agreement with one another where they would transfer relevant documents between the two regulatory authorities. So that is actually a mechanism that we were potentially be able to leverage in this matter i.e. we would produce the documents to FINMA and then FINMA would be responsible for transferring the documents to the US. So we'll come back to that point when we talk about production. So moving on to the next step in the e-discovery process, that's actually document review. So the question is, how do we go about reviewing the documents in the most efficient manner possible? Now, typically you would want the one set of reviewers to review as much content as possible over time, they start to learn more about the documents, more about the issues at play in the matter, the nuances, who the key players are, becomes easier for them to determine privilege and so on. Now, that would be in an ideal world and we would have centralized all of the data. Unfortunately, we couldn't do that in this case. But what we were able to leverage in, in this case to allow our US-based review team to review documents in almost all of the jurisdictions was the binding corporate rules that, that Stan had mentioned earlier. So EY is actually one of the few companies that does have the binding corporate rules. And this allows us within the four walls of, of the broader EY entity to move data around and specifically allow EY US employees to be able to access information that's in the EU or in Switzerland remotely. So what we did was we set up remote access for our US-based reviewers to view and review documents that are in the UK, in Russia, in Switzerland, and in the Hong Kong centralized workspace. Now, those reviewers could not pull any documents across the pipe, so to speak. So they weren't able to print anything in the US. They weren't able to download copies in the US. Everything was done in country through remote access. And that worked very effectively for every country other than China. And that's because the China state secret regulation pro prohibits the movement of, of data from China prior to the state secret review being conducted. And that includes remote access. So China state secrets would not have allowed us to remote access from the US the documents in China. So in China, we actually spun up a local Chinese document review team that worked at the direction of the US document review team. And they would ha have frequent calls to talk about the types of documents that they were finding that were responsive, but they weren't able to share the documents. They have to talk about everything in the abstract. Not the most efficient way to conduct a document review, but really the only thing we could have done given the set of circumstances that surrounded this, this particular matter and the China state secret regulations. So moving on to production, if we sort of go back to the beginning of, of this case study, the ultimate aim here was for the client to be able to produce documents to the SEC and DOJ. And in this matter, the way we handled that was by moving documents from the client to one of a series of workspaces globally. So if my transitions to the next slide, please. Thank you. You'll, you'll see here essentially a flowchart that represents what we did. So we talked about how we had data in Russia, Singapore, and, and the UK that sat off to the side and didn't actually have to enter the production work stream. And then we had data hosted in the US, China, Hong Kong, and Switzerland. So the client uh, sent documents to each of these different locations. So just moving ahead again, Mike, please. And then within each of these different locations, we had a 
unique review approach. So in the US, the US team reviewed the documents. There was no privacy re review required, and the production was handled by the US team. And those documents went straight from the US database to the SEC and the DOJ. China, as we've discussed, was a little bit different. Review there was conducted by the China team. The state secrets review was conducted by a China outside counsel, a, a PRC law firm, one of the ones that's allowed to actually perform that type of review. And for productions, the document was sent to the US team. And the US team ultimately did a QC review, reviewed for privilege. So going back to the first panel discussion, there's nuances to privilege in different geographical locations, but we wanted to make sure that once the documents made it to the US, they, they were appropriately reviewed and tagged for privilege. But before anything moved to the US, it went through the China State Secret Review. And if it was determined that the document contained state secrets, that document remained in China and was logged appropriately. And if not, it was moved to the US to go through the production work stream. Hong Kong was much simpler. Uh, the US team, using our binding corporate rules, was able to review the documents in, in China. They also conducted a privacy review, all from the US. The documents were redacted in, in Hong Kong if it was determined they connect, contained private information. And then the production was run by the US team and the documents were sent from Hong Kong to the SEC and the DOJ. And then finally, Switzerland, so here, we again leverage binding corporate rules to have the US team conduct the document review. The privacy review, though, was done by a Swiss outside counsel, and that was specifically at the request of, of our client. Our client's data protection officer was very concerned about having a Swiss law firm review for data privacy. They had had some challenges with the Swiss DPA in the past and wanted to just make sure they didn't incur the wrath again. So they were very cautious in how they approached the document productions in, in Switzerland. The Swiss, US, uh, the Swiss EY team created the document production and the documents were produced to FINMA in Switzerland. And then FINMA, after they reviewed the documents and felt comfortable with the content of the documents and that there was no private information that needed to be redacted, FINMA and FINMA alone sent the documents to the SEC and the DOJ. And this was actually really helpful for us because it wasn't actually EY, the client, or the outside counsel who moved the documents from fin from Switzerland to the to the US. It was actually FINMA, the regulatory authority, that actually did it. So really was quite a helpful mechanism to take a little bit of the pressure off, off EY and outside counsel and the client. So just to conclude, this was an interesting project. As you can see, we dealt with a lot of the, the issues that Bob and Stan have talked about today. And um, it, it, we, we finally got to a, a good end result for the client. And there, there were a few considerations and, and, and sort of general lessons learned that I wanted to share to conclude. And the first is that you really have to tailor your approach to meet the situation. And even within the individual matter, you have to tailor the approach by country. And in this matter, we, we benefited from there being an MLAT between FINMA and the SEC and GO, DOJ. So to the extent that you have to produce to a local regulatory authority in the EU, that might prevent, provide a mechanism to, to take the pressure off you from a data transfer perspective. Uh, we were able to leverage binding corporate rules, but to Sten's point, there are other mechanisms for, for data transfer that can be used. So you could use binding corporate rules, standard contract clauses, the privacy shield, and so on. But whenever you go through this process and whenever you have to move data from a jurisdiction with strict privacy laws to the US, you have to perform essentially that balancing test that Sten described, where you're balancing the rights of the individual and privacy, as Sten mentioned, from a GDPR perspective is a fundamental human right with the legitimate interest of the business and the need to be able to respond to the regulation. And that's why in this instance, our client was very specific about wanting to go through minimization in each of the geographies prior to transfer. They didn't want to just move the data to the US, even though we technically could have done. They wanted to show a documented process where the data was being reduced in each of these different jurisdictions prior to transfer to the US and certainly prior to production to the SEC and DOJ. And that, that covers everything, unless anyone has specific questions.
So I think now we'll move on to the Q&A. If someone has a question, please raise your hand. Um, I, I do uh, want to comment, Rishi, this is the first time I think I've heard anyone uh, explain how have, being investigated by more than one government re regulator in more than one jurisdiction might be actually an advantage and not a disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I'll walk away from this uh, seminar, at least with that, with that uh, bit um, of information. I have a question for Bob. Um, Bob, how do you deal with the fact that I, I, I conducted an investigation uh, recently here in the U.S. that uh, involved a, a, most of the witnesses were Chinese nationals? And um, uh, one of the obstacles that we ran into was that almost everyone communicated, including um, in a company-related business, via WeChat, which is the kind of the, the app platform that uh, Chinese nationals use to communicate with each other. And it's, it's becoming, I think, uh, more and more common than using email servers that are owned by companies. Um, how would you recommend, you know, getting access to that information or can you get access to that information? And, and how would you recommend that companies deal with that issue? Yeah, it's a big, it's a big problem. Um, anybody have a WeChat account? Yeah, I mean, basically, if you li live and work in China, uh, if you're doing, um, you know, everybody has a WeChat account, and it is so pervasive now, and it's used for everything. It's it's texting, it's payment, it is, um, it is, it's ubiquitous, and uh, but it's a real challenge because uh, it's not just personal um, uh, work that is done; it's it's business, and and so this is. Is quite an issue, and uh, EMY already touched on this in terms of the technology changing and how the our investigation tools are not keeping up with with kind of where where things are evolving with the technology. WeChat is a tough one because um, you know I think the best practice for us on WeChat is that in the company policies you make it very clear that the uh, employees um, you're going to have access to any data on computers and uh, work-issued phones uh, that are um, through social media um, and that um, the, the employee is essentially consenting to um, you accessing that data um, and using that data and potentially exporting data um, as a part of an investigation. Um, the, and, and that's very important to do up front. It's very hard to come into an investigation and then um, you know, you're, you want to interview somebody and then at that point ask for their consent to, to access their WeChat account. That's not the time to do it. Um, even with that, though, um, even if you have the, the right language in your handbook and your company policies, um, it's a real challenge because, one, a lot of people have, you know, they're using WeChat on their personal phone. Um, and so you're not going to have access to that data. There is a process to apply to the government for access. Um, I'm not familiar with anybody being successful in getting that, but I'm sure, you know, in certain circumstances, certainly with Chinese companies, they, they, they would be successful at it. I'm not sure about U.S. companies applying to the Chinese government to get access to a Chinese employee's WeChat. So that is a big hole, um, and uh, so there's, there are some best practices, but it is um, one of, probably one of the number one challenges right now in terms of uh, a lot of information, and, and the employees know that, so anything that um, they're, they're not going to do it on their laptop, and they're, they're going to try to move everything to WeChat because they know that that's kind of off limits. Do you uh, recommend companies issuing company-owned uh, devices to kind of and requiring employees to use that for company business? Is that is that would that be an effective strategy? It would be an effective strategy, and um, to at least get some of the data. And um, technically, I'm not sure how. Um, how that would work for your typical U.S. company in the IT group, and how you know what what data from WeChat is going to be accessible by the U.S. IT group, but it would seem that, you know I think that works generally quite well in the U.S. I'm not sure about China, um, but yeah, I definitely would look into that. Lucine, you talked about the variances and how attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine apply um, in different countries. If you're doing an investigation in multiple countries, how, how do you know what privilege is going to apply? It's a really good question. Um, 
So uh, people, I was just talking to someone in the group here about an investigation that um, was in you know England and in a civil law country in South America and they're working on this now. And you know the the answer is is that you're going to find out what privilege applies when somebody subpoenas you or there's an actual litigation where somebody's demanding it. And what's going to happen is, in the context of that, you know, three things are generally going to happen. One, the parties aren't going to be sophisticated enough, perhaps, especially the ones seeking the documents, to understand that maybe the privilege law they're used to in whatever country they're in isn't going to apply. So it may not, you may escape the issue that way. Uh, second thing that would happen, so maybe it comes up to the court. So you're going to have some courts that are going to actually engage in a very sophisticated conflicts of law analysis. Um, everybody probably remembers that back at civil procedure in law school and wants to break out in hives just thinking about that. But you know that that has happened in court cases, and they will use principles of comedy. Um, you know, understanding you know what you know was the primary activity related to this pr privileged information. What jurisdiction did it take? And you know, a, a number of factors will go into that analysis. Or a third, the court may you know sort of push or try to strong arm the parties into some agreement on you know what privilege laws are going to apply as they're you know engaging in discovery. Um, though that's kind of what I'm aware of out there. But yeah, I mean the the issue, the problem is it makes it very complicated. Is it's really hard to predict in advance. A Who's going to end up seeking the information and from what country? If it's in the U.S., you know, the U.S. Um, law may not necessarily apply. They may do with this conflicts of law analysis and decide that one of the other countries' law applies to that particular document or information. That's why I say, you know, thinking about this upfront in an investigation can be really helpful to at least try to cover as many as your bases as possible with what you're doing with privileged information based on those countries you know and you're aware in advance that you're likely to be are uh, likely to be involved and that the investigation is likely to touch. So oh, I if, wish I could be <laughs> if you can't have any yeah. certainty around what privilege law is going to apply, would you just recommend applying the most conservative interpretation uh, to how you handle the information that you're gathering? Yeah, I think that's generally true. I mean, you know, and maybe you can anticipate in, somehow in advance, you know, if you, if you think it's likely that U.S. investigators are the most likely people to be after this or somebody's most likely in this case to be suing eventually in the U.S., you know, you certainly want to then abide by, you know, U.S. privilege laws as much as you can, which um, which oftentimes will overlap, especially in common law countries. Um, in civil law countries, like I said, you may have a distinct situation, and you may have to take that into account and do some extra steps or some extra considerations there that you would normally do. But, you know, that's kind of the landscape. Stan? <laughs> sure. For Rishi. Okay, I have a question for Hopefully. Rishi too, but you go ahead. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, I'm curious how difficult or not difficult the process of setting up the binding corporate rules was for EY. So let me repeat that question because just because we're, record, we're recording this seminar. Um, uh, you were wondering how difficult it was to set up the binding corporate rules in your example. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so it, 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 it's incredibly complicated. It requires, and I think Stan had touched on this point, but it actually requires us to, or it required EY to build a set of rules around data protection and handling um, certified minimum standards from a data security perspective. And then we had to go to each of the DPAs in the European Economic Area and get approval from each of them. So, so it is an incredibly complicated project and process. And, and I think we really the only reason we EY have gone through that process is because it helps facilitate the global audits that we perform. So if, if it was purely from an e-discovery technology perspective, I doubt we would have done it. But because audit's such a fundamental part of our business, we actually had to go through the process. But it, it, it takes a while to get it, and it's you have to continue to maintain it. So you need to continue, even after you've got approval from each of the DPAs, you still have to go in front of them and, and make sure that they're aware of any changes that you might be making to the way you're handling information, migrating information from one server to another server, those type of things. You, you have to constantly be in front of them. So it, it was hard to get. It's pretty hard to retain. I think one of the reasons it, it's seen as the gold standard of, of the three different mechanisms because it's so hard to retain. And we know that Schrems, who, who has 
in the past already knocked down a couple of, of different mechanisms for transfer of data from the EU to the US. He's currently targeting, he's a data privacy advocate, he's currently targets, targeting the privacy shield. Uh, he previously challenged and succeeded in challenging Safe Harbor, which is why we don't have that anymore. So he's going after the privacy shield. There's, they, there's talk of him trying to potentially challenge the standard contract clauses. I think the binding corporate rules are probably the hardest to get, but there's a reason they're the hardest to get, and they'll be the hardest for someone to challenge in the European courts. So, Rishi, I, I'm, I'm hearing a practical issue with what you're saying, and is that a lot of times investigations are on at least some kind of timeline. How long did that process take in your case? I, I mean, to, to get the binding corporate rules, and as I said, probably obtained for, for broader reasons. Uh, I think beginning to the end, the process took about 18 months um, for EY. Uh, it, we, we, there's actually a group within EY that helps facilitate this process for other organizations. We were pretty early in the process. There wasn't a lot of established methodology around around how we did it. So I imagine it would probably, it could be, it probably be done in a more expedited time frame. One of the good things is it's not single purpose. So, so once you've gone through the process once, you can leverage it for all investigations going forward. So unlike the standard contract clauses, which essentially are one-time use, this is something that a set of rules that applies to the organization very broadly. And you can continue to leverage it for each and each subsequent investigation that you work on. So I have a question for Rishi and Stan. Um, you guys uh, talked about the GDPR quite a bit, and Rishi, I think you mentioned Swiss data privacy rules. I'm just wondering, are there other um, uh, regulations in the EU that companies need to be aware of other than the GDPR in terms of data privacy when conducting an investigation? Who wants to go first? I, I'll take a, I'll, uh, I'll give a brief answer and then and turn it over to Rishi. Um, one thing to be aware of is that uh, in the GDPR itself, there are certain uh, per, there's permissible certain permissible variations among the member states, and so on certain items like the age for providing consent or um, the prohibition on processing certain special categories of data or penalties for breaches. Uh, the the member states can vary from what is in the, the text of the GDPR in their implementing legislation. And I think there are a total of like 50 areas where it's going to happen. Um, but those three that I mentioned are, are kind of the common ones where you see variations. Rishi, do you have any yeah. other thoughts? Yeah, it, it, w- in one of the interesting ones that I came across recently was was actually in the in the Czech Republic and and we we had gone through this really extensive process of planning out how we're going to approach this investigation. It was actually one of those covert investigations, but went through this this very complicated process, found justification because there was actually a, a need to report to the to, to the UK um, anti bribery group. So, so we had all kinds of justification, and as we were about to start the process, local council and Czech Republic said, no, you can't do a covert collection. It doesn't matter if it's allowed under GDPR. It's not allowed under Czech rule. It's not a data privacy rule, but it's basically a rule that in the Czech Republic they had set up following the, the departure of, of, of the, the Communist Party to prevent outside influences coming into the to Czechoslovakia and allowing them to, or the Czech Republic, sorry, coming in, coming into the Czech Republic and, and allowing them to be able to see the books and records for these companies. So basically what it needed was approval from a director at the local Czech level. So, so it couldn't be approved by anyone within the organization. It needed to specifically be approval by the director or one of the directors of the Czech organization. And the challenge that we were faced with is those are the people that we were specifically investigating. And we didn't necessarily want them to be made aware of it. We had multiple calls with local Czech outside council and ultimately came to conclusion there was no way around it. It would have been a serious breach of Czech law if we had done a covert collection and a covert investigation we needed to notify them. And it's nothing to do with data privacy. It was to, essentially to, to do with protecting the interests of, of the Czech company itself and, and, and nothing else. So just one of those things that goes back to that notion that you really do have to consult with local council because you never know if there's going to be that nuanced rule in that specific jurisdiction that might trip you up. And just quickly, n- not necessarily related to data privacy, but on the WeChat point, 
WeChat has um, a business version, an application. And what we're seeing is a lot of companies in China are starting to leverage that. That technically has the capabilities to retain messages. Again, it becomes a, a, a complicated process navigating how to access it. But if you, as a company, use WeChat, and and you'll find very often people in China are going to use it for communication purposes. It's just a good way to to allow the organization to formally retain the WeChat messages. So, uh, Mike, when you spoke, you talked a bunch of, about a bunch of kind of scary. Compliance yeah, okay. issues, sure. uh, you know, here's what you're going to run to in this part of the world and that part of the world. Yep, yep. What are your clients doing to prevent and detect and respond to those uh, challenges? No, a really good question. I think if you think about kind of the common themes across all the jurisdictions it was, you know, kind of the culture slash the tone at the top, uh, use of third parties, you know, lack of controls and books and records primarily. I think it all starts with governance. Uh, first, uh, I think really it's the pushing the tone on the top, but not forgetting about the tone in the middle. Tone in the middle sometimes is extremely important, uh, especially if you think about kind of foreign jurisdictions. Um, also, the utilizing the three lines of defense. Uh, once again, especially when you're considering you know foreign jurisdictions and making sure that you're leveraging uh, business as the front line of defense and getting their buy-in to support you and support your culture and support your tone. Um, two, from a, from a third-party management standpoint, I think it's very key to have a global third-party uh, management approach. Um, all the way from kind of identification, selection, monitoring, and training of the third parties. Uh, you know, a lot of our clients are utilizing these um, global um, systems or programs that basically help them manage the third party relationships, basically screen them. Uh, they also act as, you know, document repository. They also act to potentially certify their compliance or adherence to the, your code of conduct, also provide some training. Uh, so that's obviously a gold standard, but I think definitely kind of helps corporate to have visibility and sense for the high risk third party intermediaries. Uh, from kind of internal control and books and records, I think it goes without saying is to basically roll out, enforce, and train on the global policies and procedures. You know, more often than not, we do see there's kind of the US standard and then there's the local standard and it doesn't really match up. Uh, but really to make sure that it does match up, obviously taking into consideration local nuances, um, um, in, in including cultural and operational as well. Um, obviously, making sure that the policies and training is translated, you know, more from that we do see it's all in English. Uh, also, um, you know, uh, the training could be right-sized, if you will, so for more higher-risk individuals to have, or even third parties to have more in-person or live training, and then have kind of more of the routine periodic annual trainings could be done online and, you know, through kind of lack of kind of live uh, or, you know, pers person personal touch there as well. Um, I think obviously, you know, from a kind of detection standpoint, performing the periodic uh, audits uh, or monitoring of your internal processes, your third parties, um, leveraging data analytics is also very important. Um, you know, a lot of our clients are starting to exercise those audit rights on third parties, whether they're performing anti-corruption audits, uh, whether they're performing fraud risk assessments. Obviously, I think it's just a, definitely a good leading practice there. Um, and then finally, in terms of, um, you know, investigation or um, response, is to have um, um, you know a kind of a global approach, right size approach uh, to investigation, and making sure that you are taking into consideration kind of the local cultural perspectives as well as the the local legislator, uh, or, you know, reg local regulations as well. So I would say those are kind of top five. So I think we're uh, coming out of time here. We're 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 about used up, but uh, quickly before we go. I'm going to ask each panelist to give me your one high-level take-home message for the audience today. Lucy? So I think, and this is sort of repeating, but really the take-home message is, is that there are a lot of different privileges and client confidentiality laws across the, the international scene. And the key thing is when starting out an investigation, just like Mike and Rishi talked about, um, you know, deciding, getting a plan together and mapping out where they were getting information from. Really good idea to get the investigation team understanding what potential privilege laws are being, you know, are being implicated based on where you're investigating and try to come up with a plan in advance of, you know, who's handling what information and how uh, outside counsel is involved and, and when they should be involved and what sort of privilege protection should be taking place. So that's really the key thing. Bob? Uh, I just say that, you know, detecting compliance issues in China is um, it's never been more important, but it's getting more and more complicated. So there's a lot of traps for the 
and weary. Um, need to handle it very carefully, uh, particularly given the um, restraints on exporting data and, and, and handling of personal information now. It's done. I'd say be really thoughtful and strategic when you're trying to get data, personal data, out of the EU. Mike? I'll say leverage the first line. Uh, build those compliant champion networks because obviously legal and compliance and internal audit resources are limited. And Rishi? Rishi? Just, just, yeah, so, sorry. <laughs> just, just make sure that you're balancing the, the <laughs> fundamental privacy or right to privacy in some of these jurisdictions with the need to respond to complicated issue, but making sure you have a documented process and showing that you've been thoughtful in how you've approached it is pretty key in justifying everything that you've done. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you.